Hello and welcome again. We're in Birmingham in the West Midlands, the heart of England. Birmingham, commonly nicknamed Brum, is England's second largest city with a population of more than a million. As a result of the Industrial Revolution, Birmingham became a major manufacturing centre known as the City of a Thousand and One Trades. Much of the manufacturing activity has now gone, but Birmingham is still an important commercial centre. It also boasts an impressive artistic and musical life and has the largest multicultural population in the United Kingdom. There are several universities in Birmingham. We'll be visiting one of them to meet David Ginsberg, who is studying law and French. David is in his last year preparing for his final degree examinations and looking for a job. The Faculty of Law at the University of Birmingham is one of the largest in Britain. David spends a lot of time in the law library, revising along with fellow students who are aiming for a Bachelor of Laws degree. Nick, how's your revision going at the moment? Not too bad. It's only three weeks till the exam start, so I'm a bit worried about that. But uh, doing lots of work at the moment. Hopefully it'll be okay. I wanted to know what David felt about the time he'd spent at university. David, do you feel that university has prepared you well for life? Well, it's difficult to know at the moment because, I mean, I haven't left university yet, but I do feel that I've changed since I've been at university. I mean, you come to a new place, having moved from London to Birmingham, and that you meet new people and there's new situations, and it's the first time you really have a bit of freedom in your life and make your own choices. And so in that way, I would imagine it has prepared me for life. How long does one have to study French and law for? It's a four-year course. Um, three of those years are spent in Birmingham, and we spend our third year in Limoges in France. And apart from French, are there any other languages that you speak? I did a bit of German at school. Would you like to become a lawyer when you graduate? No, I sort of decided after my second year at university that I didn't want to be a lawyer and I'd like to um, work in, in industry or within a business, in commerce. Don't you automatically have to enter the law profession if you've studied law? No, um, the degree course is, though, though it deals with law, um, it's left open for people. Um, if you want to be a lawyer, you have to do another year's study following that to either be a barrister or solicitor. But a, a lot of people who do law don't actually go on to do law. A lot of people actually do accountancy. What other career paths are open to you if you study a language and law? Accountancy is one avenue that a lot of people follow. But there's, there's various um, jobs open to people with a law degree, especially with the, with the other language, such as working in the civil service. A lot of the big firms uh, recruit for their graduate schemes, people with languages, because of the increasing international dimension of business. So it's really it's worth having, and it is a help when you're looking for a job. There are two separate branches of the legal profession in England and Wales and two kinds of lawyers, barristers and solicitors. Barristers work from offices called chambers. It's their job to present their client's case effectively in court. To practice as a barrister, you must first join one of the four Inns of Court in London and take bar examinations in order to be called to the bar. The bar was originally a barrier separating lawyers from the rest of the court. Barristers are called counsel and successful barristers may apply to become Queen's Counsel, a title allowing them to put the letters QC after their name. Barristers cannot have direct dealings with a client. That is the job of solicitors. You can become a solicitor after two to four years practical training or apprenticeship with a firm of solicitors, 
followed by Law Society examinations. Solicitors usually practice in firms or partnerships with other solicitors, but some are on the legal staff of big organisations, including central and local government departments. They carry out all kinds of legal services on behalf of their clients. A solicitor may represent a client in court in minor cases, but for more important cases, the client gives instructions to the solicitor who prepares a brief, a version of those instructions for a barrister who then acts as counsel for the client in court. David gave me his impression of a typical day in his life as a student. I tend to get up fairly early, about half seven, and before lectures I like to go into the gym, so I get to the gym for about eight o'clock. Then at nine, I'll go into the faculty, go to my lectures or my classes. Now, when that happens, so the community actually exists in order to improve the position of individuals. Today, Professor Evelyn Ellis is giving a lecture on European Union well law. And the Court of Justice said that that conclusion was in fact confirmed when it looked at the preamble to the Treaty of Rome, because the preamble expressly mentions individuals. If a member state doesn't carry out its obligations under community law, the treaty provides for various sorts of proceedings to be brought against it. There are very few sanctions that can be brought to bear against a state, although nowadays the Maastricht Treaty does allow the Court of Justice sometimes to fine member states. David lives in Selly Oak, a district where a lot of the students live. He shares a house with three other law students. At lunchtime, because we're not far from campus here, I'll come back. And normally everyone will be here and we'll get together, have lunch, watch a bit of TV, have a chat. It's a nice break in the day. I wanted to know from David's housemates what kind of careers they were looking forward to. I'm hoping to become a solicitor, which means I have to go to law school for another year after I finish university, then I have to do two years training, and then I qualify as a solicitor. What hurdles, if any, do you see for a woman in your profession? I don't think there are as many as there used to be. Now these big law firms seem to be recruiting as many, if not more, women than men, and career opportunities are really great and much better than they've been for a long time for women. I think it is possible now to have a really good career and also maybe to balance it with a family. It's more acceptable and I hope that eventually I'll be able to do both. Do you think your parents have had any influence on what you have chosen to do in the future? Yes, well, um, originally I just wanted to study French, but my father th thought it wouldn't be a very good idea to limit myself by just studying French. These days you need something else as well as a language. Um, so he advised me to do law. I'm going to be a solicitor. I'll start training in two years' time at the firm in Birmingham. In the evenings, well, sometimes get together with my housemates and we go out. One thing we'll be doing recently is going to the Greyhound Racing, which is good fun. I'll often meet, meet up with my girlfriend in the evening, Adele, and we'll go, often go out for a meal, say, to a, a Balti restaurant, which is a, an Indian restaurant, and there's loads of them around in Birmingham. David has been busy writing his CV, his curriculum vitae, which he needs in order to apply for a job. David is lucky to have a laptop computer, which he shares with other students.
The CV contains the kind of information which should help David to get a job, even if he's not yet absolutely sure what he wants to do. What type of jobs are you applying for at the moment? I've applied for jobs in the city in merchant banking, also with big firms who have a, say, presence in the city. Would you consider moving to France, say, to start work? I'm not too sure. It's quite difficult to live there at, at times. Um, when I was there in, in, um, in Limoges for my year out, sometimes it, there were a few problems, say residency, etc. And it's, not, it's, it's very different to Britain. And I've had a year away and I'd quite like to stay here. Do you think that any of your extracurricular activities at university have helped you to apply for certain jobs? I'd like to think so. I mean, I've always, especially in my first, uh, first and second year, I kept up um, a lot of extracurricular activities, uh, particularly in the students' union. I frequently mention them in interviews, also on application forms. They tend to look good, and it sort of sets you apart from everyone else. What kind of extracurricular activities were you involved in? Well, I ran the European Society at the university for a year. What's the European Society? The European Society was a group of about 150 members and we had a, a political um, sort of side and a social side and the political side in particular was organising meetings where we'd get people, politicians, people from embassies to come and talk to us what, about Europe and how, what they thought about Europe. So you put something like that onto your CV so that your CV looks better. Yeah. How do you feel about your CV? I mean, it's full. There's a lot on there. You've got to bear in mind that how much the extracurricular activities uh, affect how people see you, because there's other factors they're looking for, like your A-level grades, uh, your predicted degree that you're going to get, the subject you've studied. So though they play a part, and it's good to have lots of stuff on your on the CV like that, you've got to bear, you've got to keep a balance, and I think that's what's important. The curriculum vitae, or CV, is often the most important document written by a student about to graduate or by anyone applying for a job. It gives details of education, qualifications, work experience and suitability for the job being applied for. A CV should start with personal details such as your name and address, both at home and at work or university, a telephone number for each address, plus fax and email if you have them. Next, your education and qualifications, your university degree course and the degree you've got or expect to get. You should include study abroad and particular academic achievements. Then your school A-level subjects and grades, followed by your GCSEs with grades. Notice that school comes after university or higher education. Next, your work experience, starting with the most recent work. Include dates, details of employers, the title of jobs and positions held, and a description of the work you've done. The next part of your CV should cover personal interests, such as sports, extracurricular activities at school or university, and hobbies or pastimes. You should also give details of useful skills such as foreign languages, computer skills, and so on. Finally, you need to give references, the names of people the employer can contact to ask about your academic and work-related achievements and about your personal qualities. The University of Birmingham is one of Britain's red brick universities. It was founded at the end of the 19th century and it now has about 17,000 students. Unlike Oxford and Cambridge, it's a campus university. 
That's to say, almost all its academic and administrative buildings are on one self-contained site. The university has its own career centre, and I talked to the centre's director, Dr. Richard Maynard. Richard, what are the job prospects for a graduate today? Right now, the prospects are reasonably encouraging, certainly by the standards of the last five to six years when uh, graduates had a particularly bad time. But at the moment, somebody graduating today is faced with a market that is r relatively optimistic um, and uh, with some, some effort ought to be able to achieve a reasonable job in a reasonable time. So where do students go after they graduate? From this particular university, about a half of them would go directly into some form of permanent employment. Um, about another 25% or so will go off into some kind of postgraduate study, either vocational or academic. Um, a number of people will take the opportunity to visit far-flung places, of course off to Thailand or somewhere equally exotic. Um, and uh, obviously there will be some who go into temporary work um, and a few will remain unemployed uh, for several months after they finish their course. So how does a student go about applying for a job? We encourage students to come to the Career Centre to make first contact with us in the year before they expect to graduate uh, so that they can give some really careful thought to um, what they're going to do and how they'll go about applying for what it is they, they choose to do. Most students go to the University Career Centre to get information and contacts with potential employers. Hi, Hi. I've got an interview with Rover and I need some information on the company. Where could I find that in the Careers Library? Yes, if you have a look in the green binders there at the back right. of the room, you'll find it under R in those green binders. Okay, okay thanks very much. Thanks. David had decided to find out about career prospects with the Rover Group of car manufacturers. While David was looking for information, I talked to other students who were using the centre. Are you looking for a job? Yes, I am. Have you applied for any jobs yet? Yes, I have uh, last week and I'm hoping for an interview in the coming weeks. Are you looking for a job? Um, I'm just looking, reading up some information because I've got an interview tomorrow with a company in Birmingham. What are you looking for? Uh, general management style jobs. Yeah. Have you applied for any jobs yet? Uh, not yet. I have some applications pending. I'm using the internet. Uh, to look for information about Rover Group. Um, Do you have an interview with the Rover Group? Yes, I have it tomorrow. Um, I'm kind of looking forward to it. It's uh, a full day assessment. I'm looking for um, a work experience placement in the summer. Um, so I'm here to see if I, can, if I can find some information out on some companies. Well, I'm going to start looking when I finish my exams, but I've already applied for one and I've got an interview with them tomorrow. So I'm just coming and trying to find out some information. What is the interview for? It's for Semo Group. They're a computer software company. When you apply for a job, a CV won't be enough on its own. You also need to write a letter of application saying who you are, what job you're applying for, why you're interested in it, why you want to work with the particular employer you're writing to, why you're suitable for the job, and how available you are, how soon you can take up the job. Motor cars are important to Birmingham. Sixty years ago, Britain made more cars than any other country in Europe, and for a long time the motor industry was one of the largest employers in this area. Now it is much smaller and foreign car manufacturers have taken over the original British companies. 
One of these is the Rover Group, and David Ginsberg has applied for a job there. At the Rover factory, I talked to John Barclay, who is responsible for training young people at Rover. Can you tell me about Rover's recruitment policy? Yes, young people are, are our future. We, we are developing the next generation for, for Rover Group. So each year, uh, we will recruit between three and 400 young people from the age of 16. And about 80 to 90 of those will be recruited as graduate trainees. How do you go about the recruitment process? For graduates, uh, as for other young people, there's, there's really no substitute for experience. They are choosing us just as we are choosing them. So for, for graduate trainees, uh, we use our student placement scheme. They spend up to 12 weeks with us uh, in the year before they complete their graduate studies. And if they like us and we like them, we make them an offer of employment for the following year. Later that day, David went for an interview with John Barclay. So, tell me, David, how have you prepared for this, this interview? Well, um, I went to the careers service on campus at Birmingham University. I uh, got out the file on Rover, uh, read up all the stuff, including newspaper cuttings uh, dealing with Rover, so I could trace how the, how the company's been progressing this year and last year. You've made some fairly sweeping claims in, uh, in your application form. That's what application forms are for. Absolutely. Um, such as the fact that you're a, a highly effective, highly articulate uh, communicator. How, how would you prove that? I mean, is, is there evidence that you could uh, present oh. which, which, which would which convince us of, of that yeah, claim? I consider myself a, a competent public speaker. Um, I've spoken at the, in the debating society at, uh, at university in front of 300 people. I find that normally I can talk on any subject and express myself to people. Okay, that's fine. Is there anything about which you, you hold strong views or, or, or about which you feel strongly? Yes, I'm a strong uh, believer in further European integration. Um, I really think that um, a lot of the the way politics is going in this country is very, it's very negative, particularly for industry. So, like us, you would want to encourage uh, more more students from within the European Union to have sure. experience in in other member states. Yes, yeah. Um, I, at university, I was also president of the European Society, and through that, uh, we had a number of uh, members who were from other countries, and we helped to get them fully integrated into student into student life at Birmingham. How will you judge how successful? you are in your, your, your future life and work? What, what, what will be the things that are most important to you? The fact that I get the, get the job done and get it, job, uh, get it d done well in that uh, the satisfaction of knowing that you've completed something, that um, a project perhaps you've, you've initiated, an idea you've come up with is being used and being, and being used effectively. Okay. I think we, we probably have got enough, enough information, but I'm, I'm interested that you should think that that was particularly important. Th thank you very much indeed. I, I very much enjoyed uh, meeting you. We'll, we will let you know the, the outcome, obviously, as, as soon as possible. Great. Thank you very much. Graduation Day. Two months have gone by and David has passed his finals. He's now a Bachelor of Laws. For David, it's a time to celebrate with his parents and his friends. Birmingham claims to have as many canals as Venice. Certainly an extensive canal network was needed to transport raw materials and finished goods during the Industrial Revolution.
But rail and road transport gradually replaced the use of the canals, which became forgotten backwaters. Now everything has changed. Many old canals have been made part of the city's redevelopment projects. This canal, by Brindley Place, for example, is next to the Birmingham International Convention Center. The center is often chosen for events in preference to London. One of the buildings in this complex is Symphony Hall, home of the internationally famous City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra. Nearby is the new Birmingham Repertory Theatre. While the statue to Bolton, Watt and Murdoch commemorates three pioneers of the Industrial Revolution. This is a model of one of Bolton and Watt's first rotating engines. Bolton and Watt's engine is in the Museum of Science and Industry, which has examples of the machinery that made Birmingham famous. The iron for many of the earliest machines came from Colebrookdale in Shropshire, where the world's first iron bridge was cast in 1779. I'll say goodbye to you in Ironbridge, the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. It's a bit of a wet goodbye, but then the sun can't always shine in England. We'll be going northward next time. See you in York. Goodbye.